Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor, your host for this episode. It's got some new stories to cover. It's been a busy couple of weeks, uh, both uh, with going on in the EV world and personally getting a lot of stuff done around the house. So sorry about the tardiness of this show, but let me get right into it. First, we're going to start talking about some of the manufacturers, and we'll talk about Ford before we get into some of the bigger news later on in the week. But uh, Ford has released some new details on the electric F-150, which of course is something that a lot of people, in my opinion, are waiting for. And I think it will do really well when it comes on the market. Um, they've talked about several new details about the electric truck, as well as a video showing off a road handling and towing capabilities. Um, it's going to be a dual electric pickup truck, a dual motors, excuse me, and it'll deliver more horsepower and torque than any F-150 currently available. It'll have the ability to tow heavy trailers, which is really important, and carry stuff in the beds. Um, they also showed off a new uh, a, a render for the uh, Ford Rouge Electric uh, Vehicle Center, which is currently under construction, where I'm assuming that these are going to be built. And the, it, the prototype F-150 was tackling some uh, off-road capabilities and conditions, towing a trailer, and effortlessly effortlessly driving up a hill with a grade of 60%, as you can see by all the videos and stuff that are rolling on. So I'm just glad to see that Ford is making some Ford progress, especially in the lieu of everything going on with Lordstown and Rivian now ramping up and everybody else. Uh, so good to see them doing something. We'll continue to watch. Now, staying on the Ford front, it's great news for Canadians that they've announced they're going to invest almost $2 billion in a couple of Canadian uh, plants for building electric vehicles, which is great news. So, um, so it's good that Ford's doing this. They've reached a, prevent, uh, a provisional agreement with uh, some union uh, organizations and uh, other facilities where they're going to uh, build these. It's targeted mainly at the Oakville, Ontario plant, which is just uh, outside of Toronto. And that's earmarked to build five electric vehicles along with an engine contract in Windsor, Ontario. Uh, all of these could create and probably will create new jobs or at least add on to existing jobs that are there. Um, and investments in EV production could certainly help with the ongoing supply shortages in Canada. So great to see that that will help fuel the supply chain and get everybody else ramped up to give that, that domino effect. So again, I'm glad that Ford is stepping up and, and continuing to invest locally here in Canada. And I'll continue to follow this. Now, I mentioned Rivian earlier uh, when I talked about Ford. Well, they've, uh, of course, come out with a video. It seems like everybody targets their videos at the same time. Somebody puts one out, another one follows, another one follows, whatever. That's the way it is, I guess. Uh, they're showing their pickup truck uh, tackling the heat in Southwest America. I believe it was Arizona somewhere. Um, towing some heavy trailers in the high heat. Um, this is the R1T pickup truck from Rivian, of course. It has a design towing capacity of 11,000 pounds, which is pretty he hefty. Certainly not as much as you can get some of the higher end uh, F250s, F350s, and, and other uh, makes the models as well. But uh, this video showing them pulling a 30-foot trailer that uh, of that weight, so I guess 11,000 pounds, in temperatures reaching 47.7 degrees Celsius or a whopping 118 degrees Fahrenheit, that is pretty warm. Good to see that. Now, it looks like production is going to start for Rivian sometime in the first half of 2021. Obviously, things have been delayed a bit with COVID and everything else that Rivian's going through and all the OEMs are going through. So I'll keep my eyes on that. But I'm just glad to see that Rivian is continuing on with their testing as they get closer to beta and final production. All right, so let me get into a couple of the big stories from the last couple of weeks. First one is Tesla. Everybody talked about Tesla Battery Day, and I'm sure a lot of my viewers here watching this video had watched uh, the Battery Day uh, and came across with a hopefully a very positive attitude because I certainly did. And let me give you some of the recap of the day. I'm not going to go into excruciating detail because there was a lot of stuff covered. It was a little bit of a low-key event, but that's okay. I think the material was, there was very irrelevant. But when I talk about uh, Tesla first had their shareholder meeting, and I did listen in on that, and really the highlights to that was that they've, they can, they've had four consecutive quarters of gap profitability and they've seen a 50% growth in 2019 and probably a 25 to 30 this year, all things happening. So that's really good for Tesla. They continue to improve the autonomy and the economies of scale, which is very important, helping to drive down costs and helping to produce more and more vehicles faster and faster. They've reached volume production uh, that's their best launch ever with the Model Y. 
Shanghai from a shovel to the ground to pumping out vehicles was 15 months, which is super fast. If you know the auto industry, you know that that's really hard to do in a fast time frame. So that's quite the accomplishment. And they've already uh, uh, underway with the second phase construction for the Shanghai plant in China. China, of course, will scale up to a million vehicles per year. As uh, Elon had mentioned, we don't know when, but I'm sure they can do it relatively soon over the next few years. And then Berlin, of course, and Austin factories are being built and uh, with ETAs of opening next year, probably by the end of 2021 and, and into 2022 for those plants. And then they continue to have positive cash flow generation, which is key for Tesla's sustainability. So now let me talk about Battery Day. So Battery Day was a significant event from the sense that what I took away from it is that Tesla is looking to move the yardsticks even further. Um, one thing I totally wholeheartedly agree with, and I say this all the time for people that watch me, listen to me, well, you know, watch when I respond to comments and I talk to people and I do talks, is that we need to act faster. We can't wait for one manufacturer to build cars for everybody. We need every, all the OEMs to get into it as soon as possible, as fast as possible. Remember, there's about 75 to 80 million vehicles sold every year globally. Just over 2 million are EVs. When are we going to get the 35, 40, 50 million EVs being produced a year just to make past that tipping point of the halfway mark? We're way far from that. And Tesla, even at 20 million at the end of the decade is something that Elon wants to do. It's still far short of what we need to do from a global um, electrification standpoint. So remember that, folks. If you're passionate about one OEM, one vendor, great, but you have to look at the big picture. You can't just say, get a Tesla because it's the only way, everything else is garbage. That's not the case. You have to be objective and you can help guide people that don't know anything about EVs into making the best choice for them. And you know all the reasons why, what they're going to be looking for, right? So take that into account. Heed what Elon had said in Battery Day. I don't think he stressed it enough. And it was very important to him that we have to accelerate sustainable transportation. So how is he going to do that? Two goals, he said, terawatt hour scale battery production and more affordable cells, right? I keep har harping on cost parity till I'm blue in the face. And he, he took it dead on. How are they going to do that? First, they've come out with a new cell design called the 4680. I think it's called the tablet cell, if I got that correct. It's a shingled spiral design. It's got five times the energy, 16% more range, and six times more power than traditional cells today that they're making. They simplified the manufacturing and they skip even some steps for things like wet step for anode production and so forth. They're continuing to improve and invest in high-speed continuous motion assembly. They want to reach 20 gigawatt hours at seven times the line of output for battery cells. Incredible numbers. They do multiple formation of cells and they want to scale to three terawatt hours per year by 2030. Very ambitious goals. Now, how they're going to continue to drive down those costs and scale production, anode materials are going to use more silicone. Cathode materials are going to increase nickel, also iron, and they're all the time trying to decrease reliance on cobalt. Lithium production, they're going to focus on homegrown production in the USA. They say there's enough lithium in the United States to electrify every vehicle in the U.S. today, over 300 million vehicles if they were to do that. So quite, uh, quite a drastic, uh, uh, lots of lithium in the U.S. And they say that they have an environmentally friendly way to do that, to mine it, which I thought was uh, extremely interesting if it's proven to be a fact. They want to also get into more recycling of the old cells. Again, if there are potential supply shortages as, as old cells start coming back, you can reuse those materials into new cells and, and by thereby averting severe supply shortages. So a great strategy. And they've started a pilot plant in Reno, Nevada. Now, they also want to cut costs in the automobile manufacturing, and one of the components is the cell integration. They want to have a tighter uh, cell vehicle integration where the whole cell mechanism, the structural battery components, are part of the chassis themselves, not just kind of bolted on. And they showed some diagrams here, and they're talking about single castings as well of larger chassis components. And you've probably read that about Berlin. They've got this massive machine that's, I don't know, 20 stories high or whatever. It's a big, uh, big uh, machine that will do single castings of large parts of the chassis. So I think from what I heard that they can do the, the vehicle 
the, the vehicles in three components, the front, the rear, and the middle chassis, if I understood, and they can cast it in three, in three sections, which would be huge as opposed to getting all these little parts, uh, uh, riveting, welding, and gluing them together, which takes longer and takes more effort. So all these things, and I've really simplified, you know, what he talked about for 45 minutes, all those guys talked about, really the end result is that they predict a 56% reduction in the price dollars per kilowatt hour. And that's where we can get the cost parity. So never mind a 100 kilowatt hour per battery pack. They're talking about taking a 56% reduction, reduction from a number that's probably in the 140, 150 range U.S. right now. So sub 100, which would be great. And Tesla didn't stop there. They talked about that they want to build a $25,000 U.S. all-electric vehicle that provides full autonomy in the next three years. So, um, and uh, we should probably talk about uh, the you know Model S Plaid. You know, what about that? <laughs> So anyway, that's what happened over Tesla Battery Day, some exciting stuff, and I hope you, you realize the relevance of what happened. Not so much that there was anything today that Tesla could provide, but what they're look the steps and the, the building blocks that they're moving forward with to put in place are going to able to bring costs down and to, and to ramp up more vehicle production. Again, Elon said he wants to do 20 million by 2030, and that is potentially feasible We'll have to see. I think it's a bit of a long shot, but we'll have to see what they can do. And of course, what this also does is it shakes up the industry, right? It shakes up the whole marketplace. All the other OEMs and battery manufacturers are now looking at this going, hmm, maybe there's something we can learn. Maybe there's something we can do to kind of step up to increase because they all really need to step it up. So let's hope and let's keep our eyes open and see what happens from battery day. Now, the other big news over the last couple of weeks was from Volkswagen. I'm really excited to watch the ID4 reveal. Now, I was able to watch a Canadian version of the reveal. I think the U.S. version was streamed in probably some other countries, but certainly the U.S. version. I watched the Canadian presentation that they did here with a bunch of other, other journalists that were invited to that presentation. And we so we have some slightly different specs than what you may have seen and some different information on the American version. But I'm going to try to summarize. So I'm very happy that VW has finally come out and revealed the ID4, even though we kind of knew what it looked like. We kind of knew the specs months before because there's been so many leaks and stuff. It's been really hard to contain this as it is in today's world. However, for Canada, it's going to come in one single battery pack size, 82 kilowatt, sorry, 82 uh, kilowatt hours as battery pack. Um, in the U.S., they'll get both the 58, I believe it was, and the 85, and the 82. So they'll get both in the U.S. and other countries as well, I believe, will get both. But ID4 is primarily targeted at the North American marketplace to start. It's going to be built initially in Zwickau, Germany for the first year or so as Chattanooga uh, continues its retooling and revamping to be able to start building those within the next couple of years from what VW has told me. They don't have any firm dates yet, but that's their goal. They're currently in the process, as I mentioned, of retooling and revamping. Then they'll start pumping them out for North America out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Now, ID4 in Canada is going to come in two trims, the Pro and the All-Wheel Drive Pro. Uh, you can do the figure out the logic, but the Pro is rear-wheel drive, and the all-wheel drive, of course, is all-wheel drive. Pro at 201 horsepower, 302 for the uh, AWD. They're estimating right now over 400 kilometers of range, and that's they, that's probably a bit conservative because they they won't give EPA numbers out yet. We know the NEDC numbers are pushing quite high. Uh, and WLTP, so I would expect EPA to be well into the 400 kilometer range uh, to start. Uh, up to 125 kilowatt hours of kilowatt of DC fast charging, excuse me. I asked a question about towing and they told me it'll tow up to 2,700 pounds, which is great. Eight, up to 1,800 uh, and 18 liters of cargo space and all that stuff. Now availability, uh, second half of 20 next year, so mid when I hear second half, I mean July onwards, so I would say July, August probably, maybe even probably August, I think is a fair bet of next year for Canada. In the U.S., it's going to be earlier, so they're getting the vehicles from Germany first in the U.S., so you'll see them rolling out in the spring, summer in the U.S. first. 
Um, and then I've got a follow-up story. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but for Canada, it will be the mid, mid part of next year. No pricing yet. However, for Canada, however, in the U.S., they're starting at under $40,000 MSRP. When you factor in up the $7,500 federal tax rebate that you a lot of people may qualify for, that brings that price down to the thirty, you know, $34,000 range. That's not bad at all for a vehicle of that size and capabilities. Uh, and that's for the 58 kilowatt uh, version, kilowatt hour version. In Europe, the MSRP is 37,000 euros starting. So you can kind of do the math and figure out what they might be in Canadian dollars. They say it's going to be very competitive. I don't know if it's going to qualify for the federal incentive, if the federal incentive is still around for next summer by the time this comes out. I'm hoping it is. Um, but I asked VW that direct question and they would not comment on the pricing. They would not tell me that one version would or one option would. We'll have to wait and see. I have a feeling it may not. I have a feeling it can, might be tight for them to get it under the $45,000, so 44999 but we'll wait and see. I hope, hope I'm pleasantly surprised. And additionally on information, when they do roll it out, they're going to focus initially on the uh, provinces here in Canada that are buying the most EVs, which are BC, Quebec, and Ontario. So that's where they'll start and then they'll do a staggered release. These will be available through their dealer network in Canada. They, there is no reservation mechanism in Canada for that, but in the US there is. Um, so it'll gonna be a little bit different there. Uh, it's going to come with all kinds of safety features. And listen, you can go to their website and get all the details on it. I'm just giving you a high level synopsis of this. Some winter stuff with heat pump, heated windshields, uh, a new heat pump, which is much more efficient and so forth, which I think is gonna be great. Uh, so congratulations on Volkswagen for coming out with the ID4 finally and officially and I'm really looking forward to seeing that on the roads next year. Now on that note, um, it was a follow-up the next day. So after the launch, uh, the US reservations opened and within one day they sold out of the first edition ID4, uh, which is a limited run. Now, I think it's only a few thousand vehicles. I, I, I did see a number in there, about 2,000, I think, for the U.S. market. This is a U.S. only, so the U.S. had opened up reservations and they sold out within one day of that, which is great, okay? 2,000 doesn't sound like a lot, but hey, these are new times. This stuff doesn't happen, you know, all the time where cars sell out right away before they even close to being showing up on the floor. This is new. So, you know, I mean, Tesla started it with the Model 3 and now, you know, it's good to see others doing it. Even Europe, when other launches are coming out, they're selling out in models before it even comes close to being shipped. So these were for the U.S. and it shows potentially strong demand for the version. Uh, again, uh, so this is the first edition. So now people have to look at the Pro, uh, which is the next one, which is scheduled for the mid part of 2021 in the U.S. And the first edition was the Q Q1. So they're going to get it early, January, February, March of next year, pending pandemic and pending availability, of course. So uh, I'm really glad to see that uh, there's some initial excitement from people, from viewers like yourselves and consumers out there for the ID4. And my final story today, because boy, I'm getting out of breath of so much excitement to talk about what's going on in the last couple of weeks, is about a Canadian company called LiCycle. And they're the first battery recycle plant uh, to open in the U.S. apparently. This is a company that's investing more than $175 million in this plant in Rochester, New York State. Now you heard Elon talk about that, that they're, run they're going to be running, I mentioned, a pilot plant for recycling. Well, these guys are already uh, on there as well, well underway. Um, the constru construction, they've got the land, they've got things lined up construction is scheduled to begin early next year and completed in 2022 the capacity uh, they're saying is expected to be able to recycle 120,000 e-car battery packs that's what they aim for the first couple of years to get these going so again the way the reason I bring this story up is because I get a lot of questions about the overall carbon footprint and the life cycle of EVs versus internal combustion a lot of people think that EVs at the end of their life, uh, it's pretty negative when it comes to the environmental impact. And that's not the case because a lot of EVs have highly recyclable components, including the battery packs and systems. And here's an example of another company spinning up to take advantage of what will be a fairly lucrative market once we get more EVs out there and more turnover happening. So congratulations to these guys. All right, and that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show. Thanks for sticking with me on this one as I try to educate minds one tailpipe at a time. I appreciate it. Again, everybody that watches me on YouTube and subscribes, if, you if you're not a subscriber, please do. You can also check that bell and you'll be notified when new episodes come up. I do thank you for subscribing and for submitting comments. Always love to hear comments and questions and all that stuff, so please continue to do so. Again, humble thanks to my Patreon supporters. You know who you are. All the names come up at, at the end of each and every episode 
episode that I do. It's very important to me to acknowledge that. If you're interested in helping me out with Patreon, I know these are tough times, so I'm not going to push. Check it out and please do so. Even a couple bucks a month would help. Totally up to you. Uh, again, please, everybody stay safe. Looks like we're getting into a bit of a wave two situation. I know in Ontario here, they're talking about things are getting worse now. So please stay safe. Follow your local health, gu health guidelines. Do what you feel is safe to do. And keep watching the EV revolution because lots of stuff is going on. All kinds of stuff. It's not just about Tesla. It's not just about Ford or GM. Everybody's, everybody's all kinds of stuff going around the world. It's so exciting. Oh man, this next decade is going to be interesting, that's for sure, especially since 2020 has been. Anyway, again, everybody continue to stay safe. Thanks for tuning in. And until the next time, I'll see you when I see you. Bye-bye.